Hello and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Let's start with something interesting. Well, I think everything I say here is interesting, but I really like this. Mainstream scientists are now promoting the idea that dietary change is necessary if we're ever going to really address the growing epidemic of degenerative diseases and the costs associated with them. Um, but also to save the planet. I mean, everything is interrelated and the things that humans do to themselves and for themselves have an impact on each other and the environment around them. A study just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is the first to actually calculate the impact of plant-based eating. They actually use that term in their article. On both, on both human health and climate change. The researchers say that the human diet is a major influence on both health and the environment with food production responsible for over 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. They say that the benefits of eating a more plant-based diet, which that is the term they use, with reduced intake of animal foods vary, will vary based on the region and then they give some differences. Now we'll start with the global perspective first. The biggest gains in environmental and health terms would be in developing countries which would realize about 75 percent of the gains. Westernized countries on the other hand would benefit more financially because first of all very high meat intake in these countries um, and also resulting obesity and disease which costs a lot of money in terms of health care. They add that transitioning to a plant-based diet would reduce the mortality rate worldwide by between 6 and 10 percent and reduce greenhouse gases related to food production between 29 and 70 percent. Of course, the difference is depending upon the regions that you're looking at. The overall financial gain estimate, is estimated to be as much as 31 trillion U.S. dollars, equivalent to 13 percent of gross domestic worldwide product. The conclusions were drawn from models developed by Oxford researchers for four dietary patterns which were then used to make predictions for what would happen by about the year 2050. The four dietary patterns they used were first of all our existing dietary pattern which is pretty terrible and all westernized countries and the developing countries are catching up. The second one was a diet based on the current guidelines which people are generally not following which is that a min um, uh, minimum amounts of fruit and vegetables and to be included in the diet and also limits in red meat, sugar, and calories. The third one was a vegetarian diet. Fourth one was they even included a vegan diet. This all, I just could not believe it when I was reading it. Following current guidelines would result in as many as 5.1 million fewer deaths each year by 2050. But eating a vegan diet would be even more effective with 8.1 million fewer deaths by that time. Food-related emissions would be reduced by 29% if you follow the current guidelines, 63% with a vegetarian guideline, and 70% if we all convert to a vegan diet. The dietary changes could result in as much as a trillion dollars per year in savings on health care, lost working days, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. The group says that different interventions to change food production and eating patterns would be needed for different areas of the world depending upon what's going on in those particular areas. For example, lowering meat intake would have a big impact in East Asia, westernized countries, and Latin America. On the other hand, increasing fruit and vegetable intake would have a bigger impact in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Eastern Mediterranean, Latin American, and westernized countries would benefit most from calorie reduction and also reducing the number of obese people in the population. Just to achieve the goals outlined in the current guidelines, before you go to vegetarian or vegan diets, would require a 25% increase worldwide average of fruits and vegetables and a 56% uh, decrease in red meat consumption and a 15% overall reduction in calories. Of course, most of those calories would be in westernized countries like the United States where we mostly eat too many calories. Lead researcher Marco Springman says that while these changes may be difficult, it's going to be impossible for technology alone to address the impact the food system has on the environment. Dietary changes are simply going to be required. He adds that he doesn't expect everyone to become vegan, but healthier diets are a step in the right direction. And I think a lot of us have been saying for many years, a more plant-based diet does not necessarily have to be vegan. Uh, is good for humans, it's good for the planet, and it's good for the animals. And in fact, 
If everybody in the United States, for example, would convert to a diet like ours, which does allow for some animal foods, but not much, mostly plant-based, there really would not be enough demand for products like eggs and chicken and pork and beef to justify the existence of any factory farms in this country. We would sure clean up a lot if we just got people to do that. All right, I want to talk about artificial sweeteners. Um, very interesting research from a, uh, an institute in Israel. I've been advising against the use of artificial sweeteners for many years. Um, they're recommended for all kinds of people, but a lot of, a lot of the recommendations are for diabetics and people who want to lose weight. Um, little evidence that shows that they benefit. The problem with showing the detrimental effects of, um, of these products is that so much of the research is just badly constructed. Um, when I see a, a study that involves lab animals who are given the equivalent of 400 soft drinks a day in aspartame, for example, that has absolutely no relevance to the human condition. So while I don't think artificial sweeteners are good for you, I'd certainly like to have better research than that to cite as the reasons why. Well, there are some well-designed studies, and it includes the, the whole series of experiments I'm going to tell you about that took place at the Wiseman Institute of Science. Um, researchers there gave mice either the three most popular artificial sweeteners on the market, which are saccharin, sucralose, or Splenda, and aspartame, equal and NutraSweet would be the brand names, um, or the mice got regular chow with glucose or sucrose. After four weeks, there were significant differences between the groups. Mice-fed artificial sweeteners had significantly lower glucose tolerance. The effect was strongest in mice given saccharin, and when lower doses were given, the same effect was observed. So it seems like even tiny amounts of it become problematic. This is interesting since, again, the advice to, is usually given to diabetics to use artificial sweeteners for glycemic control. Even more interesting, the researchers hypothesized that perhaps all of this had something to do with the gut microbiome. So to test the theory, the mice which had been fed artificial sweeteners were given antibiotics for four weeks, which of course wipes out all the gut bacteria. The glycemic intolerance was reversed. Changes in the gut microbiome associated with the use of artificial sweeteners were clearly related to changes in the glucose control. And those included um, increases in pathogenic bacteria and decreases in beneficial bacteria. Resulting changes in metabolic pathways showed that there was an increased risk for both diabetes and obesity. Now to see how the findings applied to humans, the researchers used a database of patients that included nutritional profiling and ongoing data collection. In non-diabetics who consumed artificial sweeteners, there were increases in hemoglobin A1c, impaired fasting glucose tolerance, increased body weight, and increased waist to hip ratios. The effect was dose related. Additionally, and I thought this was fascinating, seven healthy and lean participants were given a dose of saccharin equal to the FDA acceptable amount uh, with standardized meals. So the only variable would be the saccharin that they were getting. Four out of seven developed impaired glucose tolerance. In those four patients, there were negative changes in the gut microbiome, very similar to what the researchers had seen in the mice experiments. Since the amount of saccharin was used in this experiment was relative to the experience that someone would have on a daily basis who consume products with artificial sweeteners, um, this makes a much better case for people avoiding these products. Taking the experiments a step further, the researchers took stool samples from the seven saccharin-consuming humans and they implanted them in germ-free mice. Within a short period of time, the mice developed impaired glucose tolerance following the implants. These studies show that diabetics do not benefit from the use of artificial sweeteners. In fact, using them results in further health decline. Health professionals and groups like the American Diabetes Association should stop promoting them. And then in the meantime, um, when I talk about this, people say, well, what then am I supposed to do? All right, well, I really don't think that the limited use of sugar in the diet is that big of a problem. I mean, putting two tablespoons of brown sugar on your oatmeal in the morning, I don't think that that's standing between people and optimal health. Of course, for uh, tea and things like that, you can use stevia. Um, many people don't mind the taste of it. It actually is without the bitter aftertaste, similar to the effect of artificial sweeteners. But I think it's much better to include a little sugar in the diet if you need to uh, than to use artificial sweeteners because they clearly worsen instead of improve health. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.